And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. May the Lord bless these readings of his word to us today. Friends, one of the outstanding features of Jesus' life was his dignity and his poise. His poise, yes. Time and again, throughout his ministry, we see Jesus in total control of himself. And it's evident that he was also in complete control of every situation he was in. This is especially striking in the closing scenes of his life and ministry. As Jesus entered the darkness of Gethsemane, he was still directing everything. And even as Jesus endured the horror of hell upon Calvary, he was still in complete command. Jesus Christ was still ruling over all that was taking place as he hung in the horror of the cross. And he was doing so with tremendous dignity. What a contrast between Jesus and Peter in all of this. When, when you think of Peter at this stage in his life, Poise is not the word that springs to mind. As you read of Peter here in the Gospels, he doesn't strike you as being dignified and in control of himself. As we reflect on this short passage today, we're going to see reasons for Jesus' dignity. And we'll also see why Peter lacked dignity and poise. And as we do so, I pray that we will be challenged by Jesus' perfect example, but also warned by Peter's poor example. The first thing to note here about Jesus is his receptiveness to God's word. These verses show that Jesus was totally aware of the course of events that would unfold in the hours that lay ahead leading up to Calvary. How did Jesus have such awareness? Well, Jesus knew the Bible inside out and Jesus knew the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus could see that these prophecies were being fulfilled in his own life. From his childhood, Jesus had not only heard God's word, he'd also received what it was teaching. He believed in what it said. And what's more, he applied it to his own life. And therefore, Jesus grew up living his life in the light of the word of God, the Old Testament at that stage. In verse 31, Jesus predicted the disciples would all desert him and they would all be offended by him and fall away from him and they would all resemble sheep that run away from their shepherd. Jesus predicted this would definitely happen whenever he, the good shepherd, was captured and crucified. For Jesus knew that what God had prophesied through his prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah 13 verse 7, the prophecy came I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Friends, when a shepherd is struck down, his sheep scarper in every direction because they've lost their rallying point. Well, this is precisely what would happen at Jesus' capture and crucifixion. His followers would panic and flee. His disciples would run and hide. His closest earthly companions would desert him. This had been prophesied and would definitely happen. Jesus knew that and he was able to stay calm and collected in that knowledge. For he could see that that was all part of his father's plan. Friends, Jesus' heart and mind were saturated with scripture. And therefore nothing could ultimately surprise Jesus or unbalance him. This was true of Jesus in a unique sense. But this should also be true of all of us who, who are his followers. Yet this was clearly not the case with Peter here. For Peter wasn't receptive to God's word at this time in his life. 
Peter was rather resisting God's word through Christ and rejecting it even. He wasn't accepting what his master was saying. And therefore, in response to Jesus' words, Peter blurted out, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And even then, when Jesus made a personal prediction about Peter to his face and spoke of his coming denial, the foolish man would not accept it. He wouldn't listen to the Lord of heaven standing before him. And he protested with passion, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. What appalling arrogance by the apostle. Peter shouldn't, should have done what James exhorts all of us to do in his letter. James exhorts you and me. Everybody should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And we should humbly accept the word planted in us, which can save us. James 1 verses 19 and 21. But Peter didn't do that. He didn't listen humbly to Jesus, for he thought that he knew better than his master. Clearly, Jesus' example is the one for you and me to follow. We're not to be like Peter here, we're to be like the Saviour. Jesus was receptive to his Father's word, and this is what he calls you to be like as well. Listen carefully to the word of your Heavenly Father, my fellow believer, this morning. Take what God your Father says to heart and meditate upon the truth of what he's saying. Let his word so saturate your mind that it renews the way you think. Hide his life-giving word in your heart that it may shape your everyday living. Let his word direct your actions and your speech and even your very thoughts and desires. Apply his word to your everyday life. Wherever you go in this coming week, apply his word to your life. Aim to put it into practice in each situation by the power of the spirit within you. My friend, I ask you directly, are you receptive to God's voice? Are you a good receiver of the word of God? Sadly, many in church each week don't see this as a top priority in gospel churches across our country. I believe there will be many who don't actually see this as a top priority. They may hear something of what the preacher says, but they're not really intent on listening to God through his word. How far up your list of priorities does this come? How important is this to you each day? Do you really want to hear what the Almighty is saying? Are you giving yourself to reading his word reflectively? Do you come to his word prayerfully, asking the Spirit to open your eyes and your ears? Are you making the time needed each day to meditate upon God's truth? Are you hungry to hear from heaven as you come to our worship services and Bible studies? And young folk, what about you? As you go to your Christian groups and CY events and camps, do you have an appetite for God's life-transforming word? Are you hungry for the life-giving truth of God? I imagine when you come home from school or from college or from work or from having played for your team, you're ready for a good feed. Well, day by day, are you eager to feed your soul upon the satisfying truth of this inspired book? And here's a searching question for all of us. Are we ready to receive everything our Heavenly Father has to say to us? His exhortations as well as his encouragements, his rebukes as well as his reassurances, his convicting, challenging words as well as his consoling, comforting words. My friend, are you praying for your mind to be renewed as you read and hear God's word? Are you asking the God of heaven to change you, to be like his son as you feed upon his truth? Do you deliberately take time to think about what you read and hear? Do you mull it over and apply it to your everyday life? And then do you discuss it with family and friends? If you're like me, you like to keep up with local, national and international news each day and you turn on the TV or the radio or your news apps on your device 
once or twice a day perhaps. Most of us do this, I imagine, because we want to know what's going on in the world. And discussing items in, new, in the news is common practice for many of us. Of course, over recent weeks, there's been constant coverage about the horrifying Gaza-Israel conflict. It's been in the headlines each day and people are talking about it. For Christians, it's crucial that we're also tuning in to God's news every day. Daily, we need to be listening carefully to the good news of his word. And we not only need to think about it by ourselves, we also need to discuss it with our family and friends. My friend, the truths of this unique inspired book are to be the foundation of your everyday life. What God's revealed here is to determine how you live each day. This is the way it was for Jesus from his earliest years. He fed upon the scriptures and this is the way it's to be for you and me. And therefore, as the weeks go by, you should be more and more familiar with the prophecies and promises of God's word. As the months pass, the instructions and insights of this book should be shaping your life increasingly. Friends, at this point in his life, Peter, the apostle, was not receptive to God's word. And this got him into big trouble. Be warned and follow the example of Jesus. His receptiveness to God's word was one reason why he remained calm and dignified in the face of desertion, denial and even death on the cross. Jesus understood what was happening to him in the light of God's word. What about you? Well, let's think secondly, that Jesus not only was receptive to God's word, but he was recognizing God's hand in everything. Jesus saw the hand of God in his whole experience. But Peter failed to see God's hand in what was happening at this time of his master's arrest and death. Peter only saw the terrible things they were facing. Peter's vision was filled with the sight of opposition and danger. Now, of course, Jesus saw that too. Indeed, Jesus could feel the enmity and hatred of many around him. But Jesus could also see beyond those things to the hand of God. Note his words in verse 31 again. Note the special emphasis Jesus placed on the identity of the one who would smite him and bruise him. It would actually be the great I am of the Old Testament who would smite him. It would be none other than God as Father who would do this. For it's written, verse 31, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So plainly Jesus recognised the hand of God as Father in the terrible suffering he was about to endure. Now no doubt the thought of everything that lay ahead for Jesus was extremely painful, unimaginably painful. But he also recognised that he could trust his father totally. He realised that not one blow would fall upon him that was unnecessary for the salvation of his people. Jesus knew that his father would not make him suffer any more than was absolutely necessary. But he could, but now this, now how does this relate to you if you're following Jesus today? Well, once again, Jesus here is the example for you and me to follow. My friends, in the storms of life, you're not to be like Peter. You're to do what Jesus did. With the help of God's spirit and word, you're to recognize God's hands and in everything that happens to you. You need to remember that behind your pressures and heartaches and sorrows, your God and Father is at work. You need to remind yourself that even in the most painful circumstances, the hand of our loving God is active. And you must keep bringing to mind that your sovereign saviour is almighty in power, amazing in grace and infinite in wisdom and won't bring anything into your life which he cannot use for your spiritual good and for his glory. Recognising the hand of God in all that happens to you is critical if you're to be a believer who reflects the dignity of Jesus. Friends, there is much mystery here. Very often, we 
may not understand how God is at work in our painful, perplexing circumstances. But this is the most comforting reality, that even those most heartbreaking things that happen to us are not outside of our God's providence. In God's infinite wisdom, such things can take place. We can't work them out, but our Heavenly Father knows us better than we know ourselves. And therefore, he knows what we need far more than we do. My Christian friend, your Heavenly Father has a most majestic, marvellous purpose for you. In Christ, you're one of his precious children, and he's a most glorious goal for you to make you like his very own son. And he's totally committed to this happening in you. He's 100% set on transforming you to be like Jesus. And that's why he chose you in the first place, even before he laid the foundations of the world. So this is God's greatest goal for you. And in his love, our God is willing to bring you through even the most cruel circumstances in order for this to be achieved. Christian friends, this is the Lord's unmistakable intention for all of us in Christ, to have the likeness of our Saviour radiating through us more and more. And he will use everything that in his providence comes into our lives for that mighty purpose to be fulfilled. This is bound to involve suffering for you and me at times, as well as times of blessing and joy. Therefore, it's crucial that in everything that happens to you, that you recognise God's hand, just as Jesus did. And keep in mind his ultimate goal for you, your sanctification. So here was Jesus facing desertion, denial and death on the cross. Yet he was a man of astounding poise and dignity. For he was receptive to God's word and recognised God's hand. But note thirdly, his realism about God's people. Jesus saw into the hearts of his men and he knew that they would all fail. And Jesus did not try to pretend that this wouldn't happen. Jesus did not try to paint a rosy picture concerning their loyalty to him. No, Jesus was very straight with his closest earthly companions at this point. Look at what he said. He said to his dear disciples, you will all fall away because of me. This night, on account of me, you're going to fall away. You're going to leave me because of my suffering on the cross. You're going to desert me. Now, of course, this included Peter. Like the rest of them, Peter would fall away. But Peter wouldn't hear of it. Peter protested vehemently and arrogantly to Jesus. Even if all fall away on your account, I never will. And even though Jesus then solemnly warned Peter personally that before the night was out, he would disown him three times, Peter, in appalling pride, insisted even more forcefully, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. <coughs> and all the others said the same. They must have been spurred on to make such assertions by Peter's mighty boasts. The other disciples surely felt that they couldn't promise any less than Peter. But friends, their confidence in themselves was totally misplaced and misguided. And their refusal to accept their master's words of warning was shocking in its sinfulness. Friends, note two key matters in Christ's realism about God's people. First of all, we do not know fully the sinfulness of our own hearts. Even as those who've been born again will never fully realise the extent of the wickedness of our hearts. We'll never totally grasp just how twisted and deceitful our own hearts are. But the other thing to note here in this point, our Saviour knows fully the sinfulness of our hearts. Jesus knows exactly what we are like in our sinfulness. So even though he was deeply pained by his disciples' failures, Jesus was never taken by surprise. 
He was protected from devastating disappointment, for he always saw the true state of human nature. Therefore, Christian friends, Jesus knows what you and I are like here today. Our Saviour sees all there is to see about us as we sit before him here this morning. Our Lord is fully aware of all of our struggles and shortcomings. Our King is totally familiar with all of our weaknesses and twisted ways. Our Redeemer knows us through and through and inside out. And he perceives our every thought and he knows our every motive. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Our master realises how we can go up and down spiritually. And he understands that our love for him can grow cold, that our trust in him can waver, and that we can be overcome all of a sudden by fears and anxieties. That's why Jesus didn't accept Peter's protests here. Our Lord Jesus has a thoroughly realistic view of human beings in our fallenness. His all-seeing eye penetrates into the very depths of our beings and he knows exactly what we're like and what he sees within us so often greatly grieves him. But wonder of wonders, he does not love us any less. Jesus didn't love Peter here any less, even though Jesus was totally aware that Peter would deny him three times. Jesus still loved his dear disciple with his steadfast, perfect love. And later on, after his resurrection, Jesus in his love restored repentant Peter. And he showed repentant Peter that he was fully forgiven. Christian friend, remind yourself of this wonderful truth about Jesus when you fail him. Your sin could easily harden your heart against the Saviour and it could blind you to his grace. But don't ever think that Jesus is taken surprise by surprise when you fail him. Our sin deeply grieves him and stirs in him righteous anger, but he knows what we're like and he's realistic about us. Our sinful hearts lie bare before him. Nothing of our foul sinfulness is hidden from him. And so when we let him down, he isn't floored with shock, but he's grieved with sorrow. And we must go to him directly. We must confess our perverse and foolish ways. We must speak to him about our specific sins. We must acknowledge our spiritual poverty once again. And we must cry out for his forgiveness. And we must ask him to grant us repentance, to strengthen our resolve, to walk more closely and carefully in his ways. Brothers and sisters in Christ, praise God, we have a merciful Saviour. When you fail him, as you will every day, and as I will every day, think on his marvellous mercy and rely upon his amazing grace. Depend upon his loving kindness, which is new every morning, and then reflect his mercy to you in how you treat others. Yes, as Jesus is realistic when he looks at you, so you must be realistic when you look at your fellow believers. And as Jesus shows amazing mercy to you when you fail and confess your sin, so you must always be ready to show amazing mercy to those who sin against you. Have fellow Christians hurt or wounded you? Have brothers or sisters in Christ let you down big time? or caused you great grief, our merciful Saviour commands us to reflect his mercy to those, to us, to those around us, and especially to our fellow believers. Being realistic about God's people was critical for Jesus. It enabled our Master to remain dignified and composed. Well, being realistic about God's people today is vital for us, if we are to reflect his dignity and poise. And so in the face of desertion, denial and death on the cross, Jesus was receptive to God's word and recognised God's hand and was realistic about God's people. But finally, another thing that helped him to display calm and dignity in the face of all that lay before was his rest in God's promises. And particularly on the promises of the resurrection. Jesus knew 
that this lie ahead. Look at verse 32. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee, he said to his men. His father had assured Jesus that in dying for his people, he would be raised back to life again in great glory. On the third day, he would triumph over the grave. Therefore, as he faced the horror of the cross, Jesus was looking ahead to the promised resurrection. And this was key to his endurance. He endured the cross and scorned its shame because of the joy of resurrection and glory that was set before him. Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 3. And this promise of resurrection triumph was also key to his dignity. For the Saviour was assured that he would conquer death. All of his enemies would be put under his feet. And so Jesus didn't allow his enemies to intimidate him. And he didn't allow his terrible trials to deflect him from his goal. And he didn't allow his sorrows to overwhelm him. For he was assured that resurrection joy lay before him. Sadly, at this point, Peter had no such perspective. Jesus had spoken specifically to his disciples about how he would be resurrected on the third day. But Peter and the others had not yet grasped what their master meant. And therefore, Peter was focused solely on the present. He had no thought of future triumph and glory at this point. The promises of God weren't in Peter's mind at all at this critical stage. This was yet another contributing factor to his abysmal failure and sin in this time of testing. But Jesus, once more, is a tremendous example to follow in this. Friends, in the midst of setbacks and sorrows, this is what you and I must do. In the face of fiery trials, this is how to respond. We too must rest on the promises of our God. We must look forward to the unsurpassable joy that lies ahead of us. We must focus on the glorious inheritance at the great resurrection to come. We must not allow ourselves to get blinded by the battles of this world. We mustn't get totally preoccupied with problems at home or problems at work or problems in the church or personal illness or financial pressures. Even in the midst of painful relationships or grief over the loss of a loved one, we must always keep in sight the wonderful future that lies ahead for all of us who are in Christ. Our destiny as God's people couldn't be more glorious. We must rest on God's promises, no matter how fierce the storms of life. And as we keep trusting in the Lord's assurances to us in Christ, we'll experience that peace that passes understanding and the dignity of Christ will radiate from our lives for his glory, the people will see him in us and will be blessed through that witness. Let us join together in prayer.